Hello and welcome. I'm Jack Fink and you're watching Eye on Politics on CBS News, Dallas, Fort Worth. State lawmakers are back in session at the Texas Capitol, and this year they have a record-breaking budget surplus of nearly $33 billion. The big question in Austin is how to spend it and how much of it. One of the top priorities by both Republicans and Democrats is providing homeowners with some form of property tax relief. Governor Greg Abbott campaigned on taking half the surplus and using it for property tax cuts, and he gave credit to everyday Texans in his remarks on opening day. They are the hard working men and women, working families in this state who sweat and toil to ensure that they're earning a good living, contributing back to the state through their taxes. They are the reasons why we have that budget surplus. Republican State Representative Dade Phelan of Beaumont, who was reelected by House members as Speaker of the House, told lawmakers that homeowners need real relief. But time and time again, we have seen the legislature provide some form of property tax relief. But to make it lasting, we must do something about runaway appraisals because taxpayers deserve better. And it's not just homeowners. Small business owners also say they need a break on their property taxes. I couldn't make anything, then sell anything if I didn't have this inventory to start with. At Manda Machine Company in West Dallas, owner and general manager Andy Ellard says their inventory includes about $100,000 worth of metal. We use these metals to make the parts that we then, then sell to the customer. And you're taxed on all of this. Absolutely. Aside from his inventory, Ellard must also pay a property tax on the depreciating value of all of his equipment. Texas is one of only nine states requiring this. All told, Manda Machine pays more than $19,000 in taxes on equipment and inventory. That doesn't include the $9,000 in property tax. They also pay for their building and land. Because of COVID, Manda Machine lost money during an 18-month period. But Ellard points out they still had to pay the same property tax on their equipment and inventory. Ellard says he and other small businesses need a break. And with the record-breaking surplus in the state budget of nearly $33 billion, he and the National Federation of Independent Business are hoping state lawmakers will take action. As a state, we ought to give the money back to the citizens. Since 1995, only the first $500 of a business's equipment and inventory were exempt. That exemption rose to $2,500 two years ago. In October, Governor Greg Abbott campaigned at Manda Machine, saying he wants to increase that exemption on this tax to $100,000. Ellard says that would save the company about $2,000 a year in property taxes. I think that $100,000 is a good starting point, but it needs to go up. State lawmakers we spoke with agree. Well, I think the majority needs to be given back to the people we took it from, and that's the taxpayers. We want to help small businesses thrive to make sure that they are creating jobs. Ellard says he's confident something good will happen this session, but he's not sure what that will be. Lawmakers have already filed more than 1,700 bills for their 140-day session. We're waiting to see the priority legislation from the governor, lieutenant governor, and speaker, which will be the starting point for debate. Most bills cannot be passed during the first 60 days of the session. Karen Borda has a look at how the Texas Capitol works and what we're calling Legislature 101. The best way to learn about the legislature is from the experts. We sat down with TCU political professor Jim Riddlesberger and political analyst Scott Braddock to learn the art of Texas politics. It is a very, very manic process. You're talking billions and billions of dollars at play. Lots of money and relatively little time. That's the reality for lawmakers in Texas. According to the state constitution, regular legislative sessions only meet in odd numbered years. Each session starts on the second Tuesday in January and can last up to 140 days. The framers of the constitution were suspicious of government in general, and particularly suspicious of government after the Civil War. The old joke is that, my gosh, it, it gives them fewer days to screw things up. Each representative and senator makes $7,200 a year, plus $190 a day during sessions. The House is led by the Speaker, while the Senate is led by the Lieutenant Governor. 
Both positions are extremely powerful in the lawmaking process. If a bill is going to pass the legislature, it has to be on the radar of both the lieutenant governor and the speaker of the house, um, really almost from the first day of session. They're controlling the flow of legislation, which bills make it to committees, which bills make it to the floor of the house and the senate, and which bills actually see votes. The speaker is elected by members of the house. The lieutenant governor is elected statewide. He is the only full-time politician in the legislature. He's not in a position of absolute chokehold authority, but he is probably the single entity that has more influence over the legislative session than anyone else. About 10,000 bills are filed each session. Less than half of those will make it to the finish line. If you don't have a person of influence to get your bill considered, it's not going to be considered. The only bill that has to pass is the state budget. That is number one, literally, in the House and Senate. Other high priority bills will have the lowest numbers. In the Senate, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick has set aside the first 20 bills, uh, and in the House, the Speaker has set aside the first 30 bills. So once you start to see those actually be filed, you'll know what the priorities are. This year is different from sessions of the past decade. It's gonna be a lovely session because we have a budget surplus. The state is awash in money, so I think when it comes to what they're going to spend that money on, it's the question of the session. Lawmakers are expected to have an extra $27 billion in the budget, but that extra money comes with its own challenges. That can be one of the toughest sessions for legislators because when people are asking for resources, they don't have an excuse if they can't come up with the money. The Texas legislative session has been called many things. A mad dash, a zoo, a circus. It's how we make laws in the Lone Star State. If you're going to watch Texas politics, you have to do it with a sense of humor. Karen Borda, CBS 11 News. Property tax relief, school security, health care, and the border are just some of the priorities for lawmakers this session. Among the legislators we spoke with, Republican Representative Craig Goldman of Fort Worth, who was elected as chair of the House Republican Caucus. Well, I think first and foremost, it's the budget. What are we going to do? The comptroller came out a few months ago and said we had 27 billion with a B extra dollars. Um, I think that number is going to be higher. He's a pretty conservative guy. And, and so we'll get an update today of how much more money we have to spend. I think it's going to be well over $30 billion. And that doesn't even include what we have in our rainy day fund, which is probably well over 13, 14 billion dollars, perhaps. So. Uh, I think that's the number one question for everybody this session is, what do we do with all that extra money? And, you know, there's already, because there's a cap, really, on what the legislature can spend the next time around. That's correct. We have a spending cap, and to my knowledge, we've never gone over that spending cap. So that's another, that's a great point is, yes, we have the extra 30 plus billion dollars, but do we spend it all? And the lieutenant governor's come out and said, we shouldn't be spending it all. We got Here's our cap. But the other side of that argument, from what I've read, is people saying, well, if it's going to property tax relief and going back to the public, then why shouldn't they? Why shouldn't they? Well, to that point, I mean, the number one complaint I hear from people in my district is our property taxes are too high. Um, so I think we're definitely going to take a look at can we use that extra money for property tax relief for people, real relief, so that they actually see it on their, on their bills. Uh, but in my opinion, we have to make it sustainable. There's no reason to give people a property tax cut if it's only going to be for two years. And in, two more, or in four years, we have to then go back and raise their property taxes. So uh, I want a plan put in place to use that extra money, not only for property tax cuts, but to make them sustainable. Right, so that it's, it's just part of the budget going forward. Correct. And what about education? Because education is always a big just educating students, population growth within the public schools, now you have another round of school security and mental health on top of all that. Correct. I think you're going to see a lot of legislation put forth on mental health. I think you're going to see a lot of legislation put forth on, on providing security for schools. Um, and correct, using money in our budget um, is going to be necessary to fund those programs. So it's just a matter of, again, the priorities we set and how we spend that extra money. There's no question about it. And another priority that we have seen is border security. President Biden just came to the border for the first time during his presidency, but we've also seen really in the last couple of years, since the last session, the, the amount of spending that the state has on border security 
as quadruple. Yes, a, a few years ago we put eight hundred billion million dollars, sorry, in the budget a for billion. border, and, and then last session, right, we put a billion dollars in uh, for border security, and we've spent even more than that uh, over time trying to secure our our border because the federal government doesn't do their job and secure our national border. It boggles my mind, and I think it boggles Governor Abbott's mind, and that's why he went to El Paso yesterday and gave President Biden a letter explaining uh, what our problem is here in Texas, is that citizens of Texas are doing their very best to fund a border security program that our federal government should be funding. It's a dramatic increase that we'll now have to, I mean, do you see the state back backing off of that, or do you No, that? just the opposite. I think as long as the federal government doesn't do their job and protect our federal border, then it's up to the people of the state of Texas to protect their border. So that will also have to become permanent, right? I would assume so, yes. If we don't get the necessary funds from the federal government, and I think the governor said yesterday it was $20 million in total that we spent that we're asking, that he, the letter said that he's asking President Biden to refund us $20 million that we've spent uh, over time that, uh, sorry, $20 billion uh, over time that we're asking for that money back. And what about the grid? Uh, yeah. Because right now, obviously there are a whole bunch of state laws passed during the last session. The PUC and ERCOT are now trying to come up with a long-term vision for what the electricity market's gonna look like in Texas, with the emphasis being on reliable energy as opposed to cheap energy as it was before. Do you expect the legislature to make its own, put its own stamp on that? Well, I think we put our own stamp on it last session in many, many, many hours of hearings, uh, not only on the House side, but on the Senate side. Uh, we combined came up with Senate Bill 3. So I think we still need time for those changes to be implemented. Uh, they're not fully implemented yet after two years. So we still need a little time. Now, do we need more generation in the state? Absolutely. because. Uh, Ten years ago, we had 25 million people living in this state, and just a few weeks ago, uh, it was announced that we now have 30 million people living in this state. So people are still moving here to the tune of 1,000 people a day, and we certainly all know that we're going to need more generation. We've got to figure out what that looks like. Abortion made headlines last year, obviously, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the new Texas law. And so what chances do you think that there will be that Republicans will ease off some of the, or, and give more exemptions? Because right now the only exemption for an abortion in the state of Texas is to save the life of a mother. Yeah. Do you see, do you well, see that? Well, as we've seen already, there's already bills filed for this legislative session. Uh, many members have filed bills in the House and many have already filed bills in the Senate. I think there's many bills filed dealing with abortion. I can't predict now what's gonna make it through committee, what's gonna make it to the House floor, and what we're gonna vote on. I just can't predict that at this point. Um, you know, but it's part of the process. So we'll see uh, once the bills start getting referred to committees, uh, the hearings that are heard on those, and then if the members of those committees vote them out and they end up on the House floor, then we'll be able to understand what's in those, those pieces of legislation and if we're able to pass them. We also spoke with Democratic Representative Victoria Neave Criado of Mesquite, chair of the Mexican American Legislative Caucus, about what she hopes to accomplish this session. I expect a fruitful session where we can move past the political polarization that we see often during the campaign season and um, you know, hoping folks will transition more to a governing mode so that we can deliver results for the people of Texas. I'm really honored to now serve as a chair of the Mexican American Legislative Caucus. It's been 30 years since a woman was elected to chair our caucus, Ima uh, Ranjel, 30 years ago. And so we want to make sure that we are prioritizing as a caucus legislation that focuses on Texas families and helps our economy that helps Latino owned and other businesses in Texas make sure that they have the tools and the resources to thrive, especially, uh, you know, given that we have a huge, huge surplus in our budget, that is going to be one of our priorities, making sure that that is equitably distributed. And so given uh, your new position, how is that going to guide you on specific legislation? Um, so I'm real excited. Typically, as a as a legislator, we were focusing on issues. So now, as a chair of MALC, I get to broaden that 
scope and help also maneuver strategy for the caucus to prioritize legislation. So it's um, appropriations. It is developing, um, the uplifting legislation of our Mexican American Legislative Caucus members uh, from focusing on veterans. And there's a specific legislation that we'll be releasing very soon as well uh, from different members, but really as a the the billions of dollars that are in our coffers right now and making sure that those dollars are appropriated in a way that our Texas economy thrives that our Texas families thrive is is of utmost importance making sure that our schools have the resources that they need that are that our neighborhood schools have that that te teachers aren't working two jobs just to make ends meet. So those types of policies are uh, very much uh, the, the main focus for us right now. So uh, there's lots, obviously, every session, there are a lot of issues. And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is this record surplus uh, that the legislature will have in place. And uh, Governor Abbott campaigned on taking, at the time, it was $27 billion, it may be more, uh, taking half of that surplus and using it for property tax relief. Where are you on that issue? So we definitely think that property tax relief is something of utmost importance to our constituents and fully funding our schools and increasing the level of funding will also impact because those two things are directly correlated. If the state fully funds our schools, that will impact property taxes. But we certainly have to um, address property tax reform in light of the rising rates that are impacting families. We don't want people to be priced out of their homes because they can't afford uh, property taxes. So that is certainly an issue um, as, as our, you know, as is helping businesses. We want to help small businesses thrive to make sure that they are creating jobs. Latino owned businesses are some of the fastest growing in the state and the nation and, and small businesses as job creators um, is, is also a, a focus for our caucus. You know, when you talk about schools, um, one issue obviously that has come up uh, quite a bit um, since the pandemic began is learning loss. How big of an issue is that for you? And is there any legislation that you're working on that might help school districts deal with that? So I can tell you, we continue to hear from our school districts and our teachers and um, in general, they wanna make sure that they have the funds that they need to make sure that our kids are graduating college ready, that our kids are um, prepared to enter their workforce. If they don't enter college, that that are that they're able to enter into and get the skills and training that they need in high demand jobs, like, um, you know, and different trades. Right now we have a huge shortage of, um, teachers and we also have a huge shortage in the nursing and in the nursing field so encouraging our students to go into those fields is also um, important for us but we want to make sure that our schools have the resources that our teachers that we're not losing teachers we have to make sure as they're you know educating our next generation of students that they're getting paid what they deserve and so that that is part of addressing the learning loss and it is it's something that our we know that our schools uh, locally here in Dallas Fort Worth and across the state are continuing to work on, but we need to make sure that they have the resources. And this budget surplus uh, is is definitely we have. There is no excuse for not fully our fully funding our schools, and so that's why we're advocating for that. And so, does that mean boosting teacher pay? Uh, absolutely, we must boost teacher pay. The fact that some of them are working two jobs just to make ends meet is unacceptable. They're, they are taking care of our children. They are educating our next generation. We need to make sure that they are getting paid what they deserve. You know, I have to also mention Uvalde because that was, you know, obviously is such a tragic story on so many different levels last year. And one thing that came out of that was school security. And so is the state in your estimation going to have to uh, boost uh, and help school districts come up with the funds to make their campuses safer. Yes, and that has been a priority since the Uvalde shooting. And I will say that that just continues to be tragic as you see the families grieving their tweets on social media. This is heartbreaking for them. And we feel how difficult it is um, for them to have lost a a child, nobody should have to go through that. And so it is 
in our hands as a legislature. We have the responsibility to make sure that our schools are safe. That And one of the other things that the families are calling for is raising the age to purchase an assault rifle to 21. 21 for 21 is is what they're calling it and and really that that's something that we want to continue to advocate for it was an 18 year old that you know got an assault rifle and was able to commit this atrocity and so uh, we want to support the families by advocating to raise age to 21 isn't that going to be a difficult uh thing to accomplish uh given that the legislature is still Republican, uh, both in the House and the Senate. Plus, you have a judge, a uh, federal judge that ruled against the state's existing law, keeping handguns out of 18, 19, and 20 year olds. Right. We know it's not an easy task, but these families deserve us to do everything that we can to advocate to change the law. The lives of children are at stake, the lives of families in Texas, and it's not just schools, it's making sure that uh, you know our churches are safe, that the grocery store is safe. The fact that we have an increased, um, it's so easy to get a gun in Texas. We have to make sure that we are passing laws like a bipartisan, um, it should be on a bipartisan basis. This really shouldn't be a partisan uh, matter of wanting to raise the age. It's a reasonable common sense solution to this. And we saw the federal government was able to come together on a bipartisan basis to pass laws at the federal level. We should be able to do that in Texas here as well. What about mental health? Mental health is absolutely an issue. The state has been prioritizing and focusing on that. Mental health um, has impacted children. It's impacted our uh, health fields. I mean, it, it is it is something that, um, you know, when we look at telemedicine and other options, we need to also make sure that we have counselors in our schools that are assisting kids that are able to identify and give them the wraparound services that they need whenever they see issues. There is still uh, policies in the works to fix the grid and to for the long term. Uh, there were many changes made after the 2021 storm, um, but those were on a short term basis, weatherization, making sure that the plants, the power plants uh, and natural gas facilities are protected against the extreme cold as much as possible. But the market is uh, the electricity market in Texas is going to have to be changed to make it more reliable. Uh, how important is this issue that and that the legislature have its stamp of approval on this? It's extremely important. The fact is that we didn't do enough last se session as a legislature. Um, this last winter, you know, freeze that we had, it was concerning that folks could potentially be without power again. And in fact, some were. Um, lives were lost in that significant freeze before the last session. And we just, our state is one of the best states in so many different respects. And our, um, our grid needs to be strong. We need to ensure that we have weatherization, that we're holding companies accountable uh, so that families are not having to worry about whether the lights are going to be on come when it gets cold. Another issue that we saw make national headlines in the last year was abortion here in Texas. Um, what is, are you going to be filing any legislation uh, that would seek to change the law? So I'm pro-choice and as a member of the Texas Women's Health Caucus, our Women's Health Caucus is absolutely looking at different ways to prioritize. Some of the work that we're doing is really looking at the pre preemptive, like making sure in terms of maternal mortality, maternal mortality is one of the highest Texas has one of the highest death rates of women after they give birth. So ensuring that we have laws in place, that they are getting the treatment, the screenings that they need is a priority. Um, I will. I also do a lot of work with respect to sexual assault. When we have women who are raped in our state, the fact that women who are raped are now having to go out of state in order to access reproductive health care is, is really concerning. And it, dispro it Im impacts women across the board, but it disproportionately impacts women um, who have don't have access to the same resources that wealthy women do, for example. So those are issues that are a priority for, for, 
for me as a female legislator in our state, um, and I can you know, share with you that we're going to continue to advocate to, to bring changes so that women aren't sacrificing their lives because of extremist positions in our law. Have you spoken with Republicans in the House who may be open to expanding the exceptions to include rape? You know, I'm hopeful. We, we've we heard discussions. We are going to be sworn in on Tuesday, and I look forward to having those discussions with my colleagues across the aisle. And I'm hopeful that some of that, there will be enough of them that will be willing to do that so that um, in those cases of rape and incest, that they're able, that women are able to access the health care that they need. And then border security, as you know, uh, the state has increased uh, significantly the amount of money that is spent to secure the border. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and whether that should become permanent spending and the fact that President Biden has now announced for the first time in his presidency he's going to be going to the border uh, in El Paso and in, in Texas specifically. So I'm really glad that President Biden is coming down to the border. We have members of the Mexican American Legislative Caucus that are on the front lines. Their communities are, um, their local communities are having to expend resources. So we need action from the federal government in order to provide um, comprehensive immigration reform. It is something that we have been advocating for years and has been done in the past on a bipartisan basis. We just need to, both Democrats and Republicans, be able to have serious discussions about the changes that we need. And so I'm glad that President Biden's coming here will hopefully um, open the door to additional discussions about what needs to be done, not just at the federal level, but at the state level as well. Do you agree with the state boosting of uh, funding to respond to what's going on at the border? So there are lots of different facets. One, we need to make sure that our local communities have the resources that they need so that people are not sleeping on the streets or in dangerous conditions, um, that people are not being trafficked, that human trafficking is being addressed. Um, at the same time, there's lots of debate and discussion uh, surrounding uh, what those funds are going to be used for. So I think we need to just really closely scrutinize how the funds are going to be used, making sure that they're getting in the hands of the, the frontline local communities who need them to address the, the what's happening right now on the border. Lawmakers from across Texas will be debating the issues that impact you and your family for the next several months. Those lawmakers include Democratic State Representative Nicole Collier of Fort Worth. There are so many things that uh, you know I'd like to see happen in the upcoming legislative session. After speaking with the uh, residents of House District 95, uh, we've developed a, a plan uh, of legislation that would help uh, support the efforts of our community. Um, you know, absolutely, we're looking forward to some property tax relief for those homeowners uh, in our district. Uh, we're looking for uh, protections for uh, renters in our district as well. And uh, we're looking for also some second chance legislation for individuals so they can get back to uh, you know, their life and, and um, live with dignity and, and respect, as well as being able to care for themselves, you know, earning a livable wage. So there's a lot of things that we're going to address, like environmental justice. I mean, Jack, you just asked me a question, and you opened up a whole can uh, of things that I get excited about that's going to help our community. Um, you know, one of the things, of course, you know, there are so many bills that have already been filed. Uh, before the session begins. But as you know, there's only one bill that's really required of the legislature, and that's the budget. And one of the things that we keep hearing is that there is a record surplus. Um, and so I'm wondering, you mentioned property tax relief. Uh, Governor Abbott campaigned on taking half of the projected uh, surplus, about $27 billion, so that would be $13.5 billion, and apply it to property tax relief. Uh, where are you on that? Well, you know, I haven't seen anything, so I'm, I'm not committing to, to any type of uh, policy right now, but there is a need. Uh, my understanding is that the Lieutenant Governor 
has not agreed to that. Um, also, we're hearing that the surplus may be, may be more than $27 billion. So, you know, if we have, uh, you know, this much money, uh, of course, we want to address property tax relief, but we also need to address the healthcare shortage in terms of healthcare access. You know, there's so many people who don't have uh, health insurance, and we could use some of these dollars to increase access to health insurance and also increase the Medicaid reimbursement rate for our healthcare providers. And I was going to ask you, when you talk about access to health care, are you speaking specifically about expanding Medicaid in Texas? Of course, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, I think the appetite uh, by the Republicans is, is, is fluid. Uh, you know, we've seen them come closer to engaging or, or at least uh, entertaining some type of additional coverage, but not with exactly Medicaid expansion. So we're not there yet. But they're working on coming up with ways to address this gap in health insurance. Uh, but I don't think it's going to meet the needs. You and I have talked a lot over the last several months since Uvalde and the tragedy there about school security. And so I'm wondering um, how, how much money do you think the state is going to commit to making school campuses safer for our students? And at the same time, mental health as well. Well, you know, hopefully the past is not an indication of how much money the state is going to spend on our schools because we've, they have the state and I include myself because I'm a member of the legislature, but I don't support that, um, have, you know, continuously underfunded our public schools. Uh, they don't have the necessary funding to, to, uh, to purchase the resources that they need to reinforce our schools. You know, the, the alternatives that they, the state has proposed by arming more teachers and educators is not going to do it. That's not going to make our schools safer. Uh, so yes, we do need to make sure that the schools have the funding to uh, implement those procedures and policies. You know, there's been a procedure, uh, there's been a, a law that's been filed by a member of the uh, Texas Legislative Black Caucus that would require one entrance into these schools. Uh, you know, that, that's something that would need to be done to alter the new schools that are being built. Um, so yes, we need to do some more, add some more of this money to our public schools, but we got to fund them the way they are now. That means we got to fund the students uh, average daily attendance, we got to re look at that. Uh, is that meeting the needs of the students due to the pandemic where, you know, we have a lot more absences? Uh, but yes, we need to do that. And also in terms of mental health, we need to provide funding so that the schools can hire and pay for our mental health providers. The, the counselors that they have in place, they're not always used in the capacity that they have the training for. So we definitely need to look like uh, look at making sure that our schools are funding uh, and paying our teachers adequately because we do have a teacher shortage and, and the pipeline is, is dwindling. So we need to make sure that our teachers receive adequate funding, our schools are, are, um, uh, are secure and not only our public schools, but our, our colleges and universities as well. And uh, you mentioned uh, teacher pay. Does the state need to contribute a, a boost in pay? so that the school districts can offer teachers a higher salary? I don't know if, it's, if that would be an exact line item, but we could uh, definitely um, you know, pay or contribute more to the other items. So that way it offsets the obligations of our current schools, uh, of our schools. So that way they have the dollars to pay. Um, you know, Dallas ISD had this uh, merit type of outcome performance uh, pay schedule and structure that is pretty much well received at the state level. And, and, you know, there's talks about mimicking that across the entire state. Uh, so, you know, these are things that we could look at and consider as we move forward. You mentioned one other uh, thing, and that was the absences during the pandemic. There was a lot of learning loss. Um, so how do you think, this, and what have you heard from educators about how the state can address that? Well, you know, the, uh, there has been a lot of uh, learning loss, you know, in, increasing and in, in funding wraparound services. So that way our school districts have funds to do more after school programs or offer uh, programs that could help offset that loss. 
Um, you know, the schools are very innovative. They come up with great ideas, but do they have the funding to implement them? And that's the problem. And we at the state level, level can help uh, ease that burden by providing adequate funding for our public schools. So uh, that is one thing that I, I wanna make sure that you know, we do focus on these wraparound services to make sure that, um, you know, that the needs are met um, and then not penalizing our schools. Because when they're, you know, we, if we de deal with funding based on the average daily attendance, that average daily attendance number can fluctuate if someone uh, catches COVID or, or, or is, is exposed to someone with COVID. So we need to reevaluate how our schools rely on this average daily attendance uh, to, you know, in, uh, to as the base of their funding. I wanted to ask you about the grid. Um, obviously, the storm two years ago, uh, a lot of people died, unfortunately, in that because of the mass power outages. The state uh, took some action, the legislature took some action as far as weatherization and making sure that these power plants and other facilities are doing what they can to uh, protect them from the cold, the severe and bitter cold. And now uh, ERCOT and the Public Utility Commission of Texas are really trying to redesign the electricity market for the long term so that, you know, before the emphasis was on cheap energy, now it needs to be on reliable energy. And so how important is this issue and that the legislature put its stamp on what ERCOT and uh, the PUC come up with? Well, it's very important that we address the power grid. Uh, one of the things that we have not sufficiently done at the legislative level is address the natural gas portion. Now you mentioned weatherization, you know, winterization. Uh, in terms of the electric market, yes, they addressed a lot of the um, shortcomings that we saw in that market, but we didn't get to the root of natural gas. Natural gas, is what powers up the electricity. And if they can't power it up, the, the electricity doesn't work. So what the legislature did was only require uh, winterization of those critical infrastructures for natural gas. We all, not everybody lives in a critical infrastructure area. So there's still gonna be a lot of people that may um, endure power outages due to the uh, not being or living on a critical infrastructure grid. So that's something that we need to look at as well. And so if we go back and, and tackle that issue, which is very difficult because the, the lobby for gas is, is, is strong, uh, but there should be some ways that we could compromise and work on uh, reasonable solutions for the people of Texas that could uh, shore up and, and stabilize our power grid. Now, the Railroad Commission did issue new rules that have now gone into effect. It took an extra year to put those into effect. Are you saying there needs to still be a review by the legislature on that? Oh, yes, because the natural gas, if, if, you're, if we're talking about the bill that was passed from last session, it only dealt with critical infrastructures for our natural gas. And again, they have to ensure, so that way, uh, for instance, in Fort Worth, our water uh, system failed because we didn't have power. Um, that's a critical infrastructure for, for our community. And so in the future, they have to, the gas companies have to identify those critical infrastructures like our water company, our, our water uh, plant. That's a critical infrastructure. We got to make sure that they don't lose uh, power. Uh, but that doesn't mean that me living in the city of Fort Worth and East Fort Worth, that I'm, not, I'm protected or that my power is gonna stay on because I may not be on that critical infrastructure grid. So I think that there's, we're, we're in the right direction, but there's more that can be done to uh, reinforce and stabilize our grid. Wanted to ask you about uh, some other issues that have been in the national headlines. And uh, first of them uh, is abortion. Uh, obviously state law changed last year after Roe v. Wade was overturned. And so I'm wondering, what are you going to be, are you proposing any legislation in the coming session that would change state law when it comes to abortion? Well, I haven't proposed anything, but you know, we've got to be very careful as those who support uh, the right and the freedom to choose. 
because the legislature is stacked. You know, there's more Republicans than Democrats. And so when you start adding on bills or promoting bills, it could get very uh, harmful. It could be more harmful than good. So no, I don't have anything right now. We're still trying to get clarity on the existing rules and laws that are in place. Uh, for instance, is, is someone who assists someone who goes out of state to obtain a, an abortion, are they subject to criminal charges or any type of civil penalties? And so we're, we've, I've sent a letter to the attorney general's office asking for clarification after I've worked with the stakeholders in that and that, um, no response whatsoever um, that would provide an answer to that question. So, you know, those are things that we want to look at, but also, uh, you know, we're looking to the federal, at the federal level for more uh, assistance uh, because we just don't have the votes to get something reasonable and meaningful done, any type of protections done for, for those who want to exercise their freedom to choose. When, when did you reach out to the Attorney General's office seeking an opinion? It was in November. It was right, uh, I think it was like November 8th or something, 7th or 8th, or maybe the answer was due November 7th or 8th. And you didn't hear? Oh, no, we did get a response back. And they said that they're not responding, basically. It was like a oh. no response. So let me ask you uh, one other question about this. There seems to be agreement between some Republicans I've spoken with and Democrats about uh, boosting the budget for uh, care for, for expectant mothers and for mothers postpartum after they give birth. Um, what are you hearing about that? Well, that would be great if we could uh, make sure that the Medicaid uh, is in place for the 12 months, the full 12 months following the birth. Uh, you know, we know maternal mortality uh, is high in Texas uh, with Black women seeing the brunt of that um, uh, you know, harm. So we have to make sure that we do have things in place uh, and, and true, meaningful health care. Uh, you know, with this public health emergency, uh, right now we have continuous coverage of Medicaid. But once that ends, uh, Medicaid, individuals who are on Medicaid right now will have to reapply and re uh, become uh, you know, eligible again. Uh, and so we're concerned about the drop off from that. Um, you know, process, you know, will people become, still be eligible? Will they actually, you know, fill out all the forms? Uh, so right now, six months, you get six months continuous coverage. Well, I say right now, because the federal government didn't approve it. And so we're working on hashing those details out. But we, we just really need to do 12 months of continuous coverage uh, once this public health uh, emergency ends or more. I mean, uh, if we could get the, the bill passed, uh, but right now, um, there is concern about um, the health care of the, the parent, of the um, mother following the birth and making sure that they have the resources um, to get the care that they need and deserve for not only themselves, but their, their child. Uh, so, so that is something. And then also, you know, we're, we're hearing about these alternatives to abortion clinics. Uh, that aren't even ran by healthcare professionals for the most part. Uh, they are, um, I guess, I don't know if I want to, if you want to call them, uh, you know, they are proposing to be uh, clinics that provide care, uh, pregnancy related care. But what they do is encourage an individual to go through with the pregnancy. Uh, and they're supposed to connect them with the resources, but we just don't have uh, those resources in place. We don't have enough resources in place in Texas, especially in rural areas. And it's more of the state um, putting their ideology of um, abortion and uh, anti-abortion onto the individual. And so, you know, when you have these clinics where a person goes into and they are encouraged to go through with the pregnancy, regardless of the circumstances, all, you're re-traumatizing the individual, and we at the state level don't, we're not prepared to take on all the, uh, you know, the, the, that comes with all this, uh, you know, these individuals having babies. Our foster care system is not strong. Um, you know, our school systems uh, are, are need help. Um, we have too many people in prison. So, you know, all of these structures and systems that are in place are, are maxed, and, and then by requiring somebody with a gestational mandate to have the, the child, to carry the child to term, 
uh, may not, it, it won't do us well uh, in the long term. I wanted to ask you about border security. As you know, the state has increased the amount of money. Now it's $4 billion to address issues at the border. Uh, do you agree with the increase? And uh, what do you make of the fact that President Biden is uh, coming to Texas and going to the border for the first time in his presidency? Well, that, that's definitely needed. Um, you know, President Biden inherited the policy, uh, the Title 42 policy uh, that was in place because of the pandemic. And what that says is that uh, you can expel uh, migrants who don't have status. And so that's what's been happening. President Biden's administration has attempted to ease and remove that, but the Supreme Court of the United States uh, declined and now it's still in place. So, you know, we had people who were in, uh, in, in the process of uh, getting their immigration hearings done. But when that Title 42 uh, was implemented, that stopped. So the individuals who were in Mexico, uh, a lot of them were waiting for their hearings because they had to wait outside of the United States for the hearings, but those hearings have been postponed. So you've got a lot of people on that border who are living in precarious uh, conditions, uh, just waiting for their status uh, to be, uh, you know, heard, to hear, you know, if they're seeking asylum. E those asylum seekers uh, don't even have the ability to uh, seek refuge in the United States. So uh, there is something we have to take action. Uh, I do, uh, I would like to see the Biden administration do a little bit more, uh, but they are taking steps uh, to, uh, you know, address the uh, increase in uh, migrant crossings in Texas and across this country. Um, I don't uh, think that the $4 billion is, is um, you know, appropriate overall. I think that there's other ways that we could address this uh, issue, you know, working together instead of just pointing the fingers at each other and, and slamming each other, um, you know, uh, in, in the media. Uh, you know, let's sit down and have those conversations and talk about how we could work together to reduce uh, the migrant, uh, migrant crossings that may pose an economic um, burden on those, those communities. Do you think that, do you have a dollar figure amount, let's say instead of spending $4 billion, how much do you think the state should be spending? Half? Well, I don't know, I mean, literally, I mean, are they, I don't know, I don't have an exact number, but 4 billion just seems like a lot and and is it doing the is it meeting the goal that is intended that it's intended to meet? If, it, if the goal is to hire, uh, you know, hundreds of people to stand at the border and prevent border crossings, then no, it's not working. The four billion dollars is not working. We also spoke with Republican State Senator Drew Springer of Gainesville, whose district includes parts of Frisco. We're already hearing that record surplus now, nearly thirty-three billion dollars, and everyone wants to know. How is the state going to spend it? How do you think that money, that surplus money should be spent? Well, I think the majority needs to be given back to the people we took it from, and that's the taxpayers. Um, and so we need to be doing property tax relief, um, whether that's in the form of homestead exemptions, uh, if that's a buy down of that M&O rate for our businesses, we may look at eliminating the inventory tax, or we may increase the personal property tax exemption for businesses. I think that needs to be the majority, but we can't give it all away because we do have some problems we need to address. I was just going to ask that because I know when Governor Abbott campaigned, he said he wants half that surplus to go towards property tax relief. Lieutenant Governor said, you know, we can't do all that because of the cap that is in place. Is there a way that you can do both, you know, protect the cap, but also give back half to property taxpayers, whether it's homeowners or business owners? We can do it a few different ways, potentially, is, you know, the legislature can vote to break that cap. Um, now, I think if, in my opinion, for me, as long as the remaining items are below population inflation and tax relief, I'm happy to vote to break the cap if it's only for tax relief. And so we could do it that way. We could also do some things that would push it to the voters in constitutional amendments to have them ratify different things like the homestead exemption. And you know, you mentioned the state has other needs, obviously. In, in ranked order, um, where, where do you put those needs? 
Look, I, you know, it, it, when we talk rank order, it depends who you are. If I say we need to do, we need to make sure our retired teachers, you know, get in, get a raise because of cost of living and the inflation caused, you know, the, by the administration in D.C., you know, retired teachers, that would be theirs. I got to tell you, mental health is, is, a, is a problem in Texas. We probably have 15 percent of people that are in county jails are waiting competency to stay in trial, and they've been sitting in jail sometimes as long as one and two years. So mental health is a big deal that we need to be able to address. School safety, I mean, if you have kids in school, you wanna know your kids are safe. And so making sure we're doing things to prevent Uvalde, part of that being the mental health, but also hardening our schools, you know, locks, bulletproof windows, looking at barriers to where people can't drive through uh, and just mow people down with trucks as well. It's gotta be one of those. Border security, I mean, it, that affects every one of us. Um, and it's not just the fentanyl, the human trafficking, uh, it's everything we're seeing coming across. So, you know, I think that, you know, we're gonna be looking at border security as one of those big issues as well. Um, let me go back to uh, teachers, because you talked about retired teachers. What about, uh, because there's a, a real need for teachers and a shortage, a lot of, of them have left the profession. Does the state need to kick in more money for teachers, you know, the new teachers? You know, if we were able to, we did it two sessions ago, we raised that minimum threshold and we put a percentage that had to go to teachers. If we do something that's increasing funding, it has to go to the teachers in the classroom to, to be able to attract them. But we're seeing shortages everywhere. Health and human services, uh, correctional officers. I talked mental health. There's, in today in Wichita Falls, there's 300 staff members short which has 200 empty beds for mental health. And so we, we face that throughout the state. So we also have to look at how we're funding and paying all of our state employees, and that includes teachers as well. It's kind of like a vicious cycle. You have empty beds because you don't have the employees to, to, to staff them. That's right. Beds, which makes the problem worse. That's, that's exactly right. And, and so it, it just, it, it drives through there. But like I said, you know, with that budget surplus, I've, I've brought an idea to the Lieutenant Governor and we'll see how that goes on on potentially if that's a solution. But I know that, you know, most senators are looking at mental health as one of the big issues for the session. Care to share your idea? Sure, I mean, look, Texas has got money. As we said, we were over $30 billion. I'd love to see $150 million go like an enterprise fund that attracts businesses, but to attract the 5,000 mental health professionals we're short into the state. Let's give each of them $30,000, let them move to Texas, whether they're from New York to California, if they want to come to Texas, they probably are looking to get away from what they're living in anyway. And so, hey, look, so we do it with companies. Why not do it with individuals? In, in the mental health field. In the mental health field. And they'd have like a two-year requirement to work in, in, the, in the public space. Um, you mentioned border security. It's now $4 billion that the, the state has spent um, just in this uh, two-year period. Does that need to become permanent? No, I hope it doesn't need to become permanent. I think it's going to continue to stay in as long as this administration continues to, the policies that they're that they have in place. Uh, I hope after this two years, uh, we get a Republican administration in Washington that secures our border, does the things to prevent that. Texas will always spend some level in there, uh, just like we did under the Trump administration, to make sure we fill the gaps that are specific to Texas, uh, to make sure the unique circumstances of the border are being addressed. Um, I also wanted to ask you about crime. Um, the lieutenant governor has said he wants more penalties on people who are using guns uh, illegally. Uh, where are you on that? Look, I, I think that's right. I mean, we want to protect the law-abiding citizens that carry guns. And therefore, we want to punish those who are doing wrong with guns. Um, and so I would support anything um, that makes it a, a tougher crime if you use a gun in a crime you ought to have a mandatory 10-year sentence. I think it sends a real strong message for that guy who's sitting in there for the first time thinking he's gonna do a crime with a gun to rob somebody, uh, to rob a store or anything like that. On the flip side, Democrats still want to make it, uh, so to raise the age for people to buy a gun from 18 to 21. Do you see that passing? I don't see that passing because I think we're looking at court cases that are already saying that's unconstitutional. Um, so I think there's other ways we can do to address that. One is the mental health aspect, and, and we'll find other ways to make sure we're addressing it, too. And my last question to you is about abortion. Obviously, that made a lot of headlines last year with the overturning of Roe v. Wade and Texas's new abortion law. Uh, Senator Robert Nichols uh, said uh, a few months ago that he would be open to the idea 
of uh, increasing the, exem the exemptions from now, where it's just to save the life of the mother, to also include rape. I think another senator, Senator Huffman, said the same thing. Do you see that passing? I, look, I, you know, we'll, there's going to be a lot of legislation filed. Um, I'm not sure that that has the votes to, to get through the Senate. Um, you know, we, we're going to focus, I think, in the budget, uh, in talking with Senator Huffman, of making sure we have things for those mothers that are giving birth to make sure that the kids are taken care of. It's not just, you know, post, post-mortem, postpartum uh, that we're addressing, but we're going to address those and make sure that the funding is right to make sure that those kids are taken care of. Uh, we want to, they're, they're God's children, so we want to welcome them into this world. You can see the full interviews plus our complete coverage of the 88th Texas Legislative Session on our website, cbsdfw.com. That's all for Eye on Politics this week. I'm Jack Fink. Thank you for joining us. You're watching CBS News, Dallas-Fort Worth.